So, uh, as you guys know, I came to the United States and uh, autobiographically, a little bit about the, the topic of my presentation. Um, coming later to Sarah, uh, I don't share the philosophical background of most of the folks in this room. In fact, I'm a descendant of uh, Cambridge, famous Cambridge scholars, Russell, Wittgenstein, and more. Uh, and so I come lately to uh, continental philosophy and, and uh, been sort of entranced with Sarah's way of helping rethink problems that have plagued analytic philosophers over time. And uh, in particular, this paper is an application of Sarsian thought or ideas to a problem that I was working on some uh, years ago when I was first a PhD student, uh, which is a problem in contemporary metaethics. So the title of my paper is uh, Navigating the Euthyphro Dilemma, a Sarsian Heading. Uh, essentially, uh, what I'll go over in my presentation is just a sort of very quick explanation of what the dispute is. Uh, I'll talk about Schaefer Landau's, uh, who's the, the person I'm in conversation with, uh, his version of the famous dilemma from the Euthyphro, which I think we're all familiar with uh, from Plato's dialogue. And then I'm going to talk about a way to perhaps chart a Sarsian heading through this dilemma uh, using the illustrations of Scylla and Charybdis as sort of uh, mythological flavor to this discussion, beating a cliche to death, but it seems appropriate in this circumstance. Uh, so the dispute is a really fine grained one uh, between what's called, uh, on one hand, a group of folks called robust moral realists, on the other hand, uh, what we call moral constructivists, okay? So moral realists of various stripes in the, in the particular version that I'm looking in discussion with, alighting some distinctions, uh, follows this sort of GE more genealogy that moral facts or properties are not reducible to any sort of naturalistic explanation. They're an ontological category all of their own, right? So if we talk about goodness, that isn't the same thing as saying pleasure or something like that. So uh, that's fine. No, <laughs> I would not. Let's just uh, let's just carry on. <laughs> that's, that's perfectly fine. Uh, Did you want to share the slide? I can't, and that was yeah one one issue we brought into. So, uh, moral constructivists and moral realists uh, agree, sort of looking at the grand scheme of the sort of meta ethical landscape on what's called cognitivism, right, as opposed to non cognitivists. Now, cognitivists and meta ethics share a certain set of commitments about the relationship between moral statements and moral facts, right? So uh, I wish Emiliano was still here because it has something to do with truth by reference and some of the things that he was talking about. So uh, moral judge, uh, moral realists and moral constructivists agree that moral judgments, like it's wrong to cheat on a test, or as you would say, an examination, express an actual belief rather than an act of affective state like a kind of pro-attitude or something like that. Uh, similarly, Realists and constructivists agree that moral judgments are truth functional, meaning they can be, they're capable of being true or false, and therefore capable of being plug, plugged into traditional logics, like uh, analogical induction or deductive proofs. Uh, and thirdly, moral realists and constructivists agree that moral judgments are evaluable against the set of what we call moral facts, right? So there's a kind of truth by reference, there's a kind of moral fact of the matter that a moral proposition refers to, and that proposition, the, the fact makes it either true or false, right? The sort of way that we talk about true or false uh, answers on tests. What moral realists and constructivists dispute is the ontological status of the moral facts, right? So the robust realist of the, in the form of someone like G.E. Moore would say uh, moral facts are this sort of irreducible ontological category all their own, where the constructivists uh, would say uh, moral facts are the product of some kind of uh, process of construction where you take a sort of non-moral uh, element, you put it through some kind of functional procedure and out pops moral facts at the end. Like my favorite metaphor for this is the old Plato extruder. Did you guys have that in the UK? You take a lump of Plato and drop it in, you turn the crank and now you have star shapes. I mean, that's, that's effectively the idea of moral constructivism. And there are a variety of different versions that I'm sort of glossing over. But uh, for my part, and part of the reason why this is uh, autobiographical is that I have for most of my career been a constructivist of the contractarian variety, right? So moral facts are the products of the kind of contractarian structure where it's the uh, attitudes and agreements of either hypothetical or actual agents that settle the question of what moral facts there are. So an example of something like a, a sort of actual contractual circumstance would be students signing up for a seminar, they agree to be academically honest, so forth. You've got a, a literal moral fact that comes into being through that agreement. 
Uh, a more hypothetical sort of model would be one like John Rawls, uh, where very much like you described, we have this sort of reduction down to an idealized state and these sort of idealized hypothetical contractors who've been blinded to all difference, go through a process of moral construction, and at the end, they yield the set of principles that society is then responsible to. Uh, and I very much fell in that sort of tradition, uh, although my inflection on this was to think about it through the lens of John Searle's philosophy of language, which for a variety of reasons became uh, untenable to me. Uh, so I've been looking for a way to maintain my constructivism while simultaneously accommodating some of my other philosophical commitments. And it's in here that I think Sarah's interesting and useful and more on that in just a second. Uh, so why be a constructivist in the first place? I think the answer from the philosophical tradition that I hail from is that you get a metaphysically cheaper version of moral realism, right? So Occam's razor is still a primary principle of theory selection. And insofar as you pay less of an ontological price tag to maintain moral facts, that makes constructivism more theoretically attractive than a robust moral realism. You have the same explanatory power without having to add as much into your ontology. As my old mentor when I was a chef said, if you can't taste the item in your soup, don't add it to the recipe. And so uh, that's sort of my motivation for being a constructivist. And I think that's true for most constructivists. But robust moral realists like Russ Schaefer Landau, who's sort of the, the contemporary uh, champion of Moore's version of uh, non-reductive moral realism, has some pretty serious reservations. He argues that any version of moral constructivism has to be able to resolve the dilemma that first appears in Plato's Euthyphro. Right? As we know, uh, the discussion between Socrates and Euthyphro has to do with the genesis of uh, moral truth and what the God's relationship is to that. So I reconstructed uh, Schaefer Landau's argument in regular premise form as opposed to going through the whole thing. Uh, but the first premise of the argument is the common ground premise that there are moral facts, principles, and so on, or properties that both the moral realist and the constructivist agree on. The second premise of his argument represents the constructivist position. Uh, first, that moral facts are the product of a transformative process. Non-moral material becomes moral as a function of this uh, constructive process. Now, uh, Schaefer Landau argues that in order for this to be a descriptively adequate picture of morality, to have the explanatory power that it purports to have, the facts that emerge from this process have to be uh, consonant with the phenomenon that they're introduced to explain, right? So if we have a theory of moral construction that explains the tides, it's not actually doing its job, is the intuition behind it that, that, that motivates the third premise. Um, so uh, Schaefer Landau and other realists take it that there's a kind of set of fairly well describable moral intuitions that we have that we're able to refer back to things like, you know, murdering people is wrong and we ought to tell the truth, absent countervailing conditions and so on. Uh, so any descriptively adequate process has to yield that certain result. Uh, fourth, the fourth premise of his argument is that the process of construction has to have constraints and those constraints have to enable us to differentiate between moral and non-moral outputs, right? So the Plato extruder has to actually uh, work <laughs> is another way of putting it. Now, here's where the dilemma comes in. Uh, he thinks that one of two possibilities is true. Either the constraints that govern the process of moral construction contain moral content, or they don't, right? So they're either kind of moralized limit or constraint, or they're not. And, and this is really the premise that, that makes the argument work, right? So uh, you can probably see where this is headed. It's not very hard to kind of track the line of thought here. Uh, and here I'm gonna use Schaefer Landau's voice to tease out the implications, he says, if the constructivists do in fact import moralized constraints, they effectively abandon constructivism because this path acknowledges the existence of moral constraints that are conceptually and explanatorily prior to the edicts of the agent or agents doing the construction. These constraints are not themselves the product of construction, so there would be no moral facts or reasons that attain independently of constructive functions. And this is realism, not constructivism, which is to say, uh, I'm calling this Scylla, right? The giant sea monster that babbles the sailors up, right? So um, if, if, if that's the case, then moral realism devours constructivism. There's nothing left over because Scylla's devoured the sailors on that ship. Uh, there's some justice to this complaint. If you think about a kind of Rawlsian model of, 
uh, constructivism, it isn't that the contractors in this hypothetical scenario have no values at the outset, they do, right? So the, there's a contract that's being negotiated. There is a kind of common space that's being divided on a Rawlsian model. Now, there's a process for how that's divided, but the goods antecede the process itself, in which case Schaefer Landau's complaint here has some justice that that, that really is a kind of moral realism. There's a moral fact of the matter before the, the negotiation occurs. Right? Now, what about the other direction? What if we veer too close to Charybdis? Right? Well, if the sef second disjunct in that premise is true, uh, then it looks like the third premise can't be satisfied. And that's the premise that says we have to have something that's recognizably moral at the end. Right? Uh, why? Because Charybdis drains out the moral content. The whirlpool sucks all the moral uh, matter out of the claims that we're trying to generate. So in Schaefer Landau's words, if constructivism is to avoid dignifying the arbitrary choices of idealized agents, and if it's to avoid lapsing into realism, then it must insist that these choices are exemplary because of having been formed through the exceptional attentiveness to non-moral reasons. But if the reasons that are constraining the choices of the favorite agents are not moral reasons, it's hard to see why the final outcomes of the initial conditions should be definitive of morality. So we end up with something that might be completely arbitrary uh, and have no relation to what we would traditionally call morality. So in many arguments, you have the, uh, the sort of thought experiment of God waking up one day and reversing the Ten Commandments. Right? We would say, well, there's not a problem with us and our thoughts about morality. Then that's something that's wrong with the process of making morality. Uh, that that kind of arbitrariness becomes problematic. So the conclusion Schaefer Landau draws is that constructivism is either theoretically redundant and therefore pointless. It doesn't explain morality at all. Or it doesn't explain what it's introduced to explain in the first place. We don't get a recognizable morality out of it. So the conclusion he draws is that if one wants to be a cognitivist of this form, where you can have beliefs that refer to moral facts, then you ought to be a robust moral realist. Right? So that's the, the conclusion that he draws out. Now, uh, I may do a little bit of reading at this point. So knock some things up. Uh, if Schaefer Landau's proof by, by division into cases is sound, it would land a serious, if not decisive, blow against constructivism. But I maintain the argument isn't sound because the key premise, number five, is dubious, given that Schaefer Landau frames the or as exclusive rather than inclusive, right? And this is where I think the Sarazian uh, finding the, including the excluded third is really helpful. Uh, in other words, the argument presupposes a mutual exclusivity between moral and non-moral constraints on the process that creates a false dichotomy. In the Sarazian spirit, there's a middle path to sail between the sea monsters. Uh, the plausibility of this premise hinges on a sharp distinction between moral facts and evaluations and those of other branches of normativity. For example, aesthetics, logic, and epistemology. And I think you brought up that there's an aesthetic dimension to everything, and that really resonated with me. Uh, and of course, Sheriff Landau thinks that a firm partition exists between these areas of norm or branches of normativity because of his pre existing commitment to this robust moral realism. So there's a piece of me that thinks uh, there's a, there's a, air of begging the question happening here, that uh, part of what Schaefer Landau, his intuitions depend on the premises he's trying to prove. Uh, to be fair, however, it does seem that the constructivist has to be committed to some kind of evaluative or normative realism, right? After all, the very notion of constraint has an evaluative aspect and implies limits, but that does not entail a commitment to moral realism of the short sort that Schaefer Landau defends. Uh, what he misses is the point that constraints might be both moral and non-moral, or perhaps more clearly stated, that moral limits may assume a moral significance, non-moral limits may assume a moral significance in certain contexts, situations, or to think of it in a Sarazian term, may vary given a local set of relations. Uh, now, that being said, the robust moral realist is entitled to demand a coherent constructivist account of how these constraints work and how this translation into moral content occurs, and I think this is where Sarah becomes useful. Right? At first glance, and I'll admit this, turning to Sarah in this debate is a really weird thing to do, and you probably already picked up on that, uh, because I think that Sarah is very open about his desire to get past philosophy of language, and this is very much a kind of philosophy of language debate, uh, and he doesn't really have much effort anything directly to say about whether moral judgments are truth functional or whether they express beliefs or any of the sort of um, 
cognitivist claims that I'm defending. Uh, and further, I would say Sears nosiology, which I'm using here purposefully, a, a term I've really fallen in love with, frankly, uh, is committed to neither the view that theoretical knowledge is exhaustively propositional in nature, which is the debate here between the moral realist and the constructivist, nor that knowledge should be understood in the classical formulation of true justified beliefs, which is also assumed by this debate. Uh, and it's certainly safe to say that Sarah is suspicious of parsimony as a theoretical desideratum deriving this whole discussion. Uh, and so there's, <laughs> it is a strange fit, but I believe that his metaphysics of ethics, which I think is constructivist, offers the safe middle path through the Scylla and Charybdis of Schaefer Landau's dilemma. Uh, and I think that his account of the emergence of normativity conjoined with a discussion of how those norms take on definite values in different contexts or local circumstances provides the explanation that the robust realist would like. So uh, before I launch into that, let me just see how much time I have. I do wanna say that uh, one thing that occurred to me lately as I was working on this presentation in a very serious in spirit, uh, that the arbitrariness that worries Schaefer Landau already presupposes a model of rationality that Sarah would reject, right? The idea that there are reasons that could condition a judgment in advance that could uh, sort of guide your choices or actions that pre-exists is a mistake from a sort of Sarah's in perspective. And I think that uh, I think we might have mentioned this yesterday. Uh, I think there's multiple meanings of the word arbitrary going on in Sarah all at once, right? As we see in his work, there's uh, uh, diving into ambiguity and inviting us to tease out certain meanings or implications in specific contexts. And I think that uh, arbitrariness can mean at least three different things. Uh, one of which is the way that Shaver Landau uses it, that there's no reason to choose this over that, right? the lack of guiding rational principle, but it can also mean uh, a kind of teleological arbitrariness, right? That there's no pre-existing purpose to things. And more in the Sarsian point, although that's definitely part of Sarah's way of thinking, uh, arbitrariness can refer to, uh, it has a sort of mathematical or quantificational logic sense where an operator can stand in for any member of a given set. Right, which is symbolized and actually paraphrased lots of times it's for any arbitrary member. And it's the universal symbol in quantificational logic. Right, so you, have, you guys know the quantifier I'm talking about? I'll put this on the board. It might be used down the road. So in quantificational logic, this symbol stands for for any, and it ranges over an entire domain of discourse or uh, area of discussion. So we symbolize any member of that universal set with, this, with the letter X, and then we can say meaningful things about it propositionally like this, for any x, say big A little x, then big O little x, which might translate into natural English as for any American, or for any x, if x is American, then x is obnoxious. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that's a sense of arbitrariness that Sarah is getting at when he talks about algebra, right? The x that could stand in for any number of different values. Uh, and the same thing is basically true here. So arbitrariness isn't inherently a bad thing, and it isn't inherently a sort of unbounded or ungoverned kind of phenomenon, right? So I just wanted to think about that. And, and thinking of arbitrariness this way uh, shows a kind of move away from geometrical thinking and more into the kind of algorithmic thought that seems to show up in Sears' work. Uh, so, so returning back to the discussion, it looks like the moral realist is still entitled to a kind of explanation about where normativity comes from, because in some sense, we've just moved the question back one step, right? Are there moral facts? No. Are there evaluative facts? Yes. And there's still something there to explain, right? Uh, so I'm going to draw on the account for the natural contract, and I've really benefited from everyone's discussion so far. Um, in the natural contract, Sarah employs the example of the Harpa and I'm sure I've mispronounced that, the land surveyors who would repartition the land after the Nile's floods to illustrate how the emergence of constraints occurs. The same creative function shows up in different contexts by the Klinemann and the birth of physics, that which starts to uh, show sense, by any given dog marking its territory, by a greedy kid licking a piece of pizza, and by polluting mega corporations. All of them are partitioning. Uh, normativity does not exist outside of pockets of space and time. It's not a separate category of being. Neither does Sarah's metaphysics admit of any cosmic purpose. Value is born into the world haphazardly at the same time as the genesis of existing singularities. 
And singularities in this sense are aleatory, stochastically distributed pockets of space-time value, existing locally as instances of ordered negentropy between chaotic poles. Uh, evaluation, the normative, happens to come into being coextensively with any form of organization, physical, thermodynamic, biological, human, informational. So normativity is implicated in the figure of the contract that Sarah employs to explain reality and implied by the establishment and communication of limit. By thinking about existence contractually, Sarah acknowledges that genesis involves performativity. The partition of space is established performatively. Uh, and on its linguistic model, as Bill was talking about earlier, performative language of which contractual promises are but one example, uh, these are utterances that did not merely describe a state of affairs, but also create one simultaneously. This is because performative utterances are simultaneously acting upon and instituting a state of affairs. For example, the sentence, I promise to take out the trash, creates a circumstance where the promisee, uh, the one to whom I've promised to take out the trash, holds positive rights against the promiser, me. A previously non-existent bond is created by the act of promising, and that bond is now a fact that can be referred to in a judgment as it is want to be should I fail in my duty, right? You promise to take out the trash. Uh, of course, and this is why I find really exciting, uh, Sarah's work implies broadening how we understand performativity, right? Uh, and Sarah, I should say Searle's account was very much rooted in the same, being a descendant of those philosophers of language that, that Bill was mentioning earlier. Uh, it's about collective acceptance and how we treat certain phenomena socially. Uh, but this is the neat thing about Sarah's moving the notion of performativity beyond language that I find particularly inspiring. So uh, since contractual bonds obtained between the constituents of what other philosophers call inert matter, uh, Sarah'sian performativity requires neither complex mental states nor biological brains. That means we don't need mental phenomena like beliefs, desires, or intentionality in folk psychological terms. Neither do we necessarily need things like pro-attitudes and reductive materialist psychologies. Human agency and intentionality are often involved in social and legal contracts, but this is not essential to the notion of contract more generally. Second, if neither minds nor brains are necessary for the performative, then it follows a fortiori that language, at least understood as the representational form employed by most human beings, is also needless. Contracts don't have to be linguistic, but they do have to be communicative. So thinking of communication as broader than language and not exclusive to humanity, uh, we see through Sayre's work that this is the hallmark of any form of organization uh, in his metaphysics as information exchange. To be is to receive, store, translate, and admit information and this is true at every level of organization, from the microphysical to the astronomical. In effect, everything that exists amidst noise and sense, or meaning, begins to emerge with the introduction of harmony. When a second thing takes up the noise of the first, or when the second becomes entangled in the first spontaneous trajectory, or in the exchange of information, the contract begins. But these shouldn't be understood as static, as many of you have pointed out, since nothing in the world is permanently anchored. All contracts create open systems. Things drift, floating along the currents of duration or in tropic time, porous and metastable. The contracts that bind a given form of organization are just constantly being renegotiated and the parties in the contract change over time. So this is not a foundation or justificational state of affairs. It's a continuous process of information exchange, translation and negotiation. Similarly, the values embedded or implicated in a particular contract will undergo continuous transformation. So moral facts understood this way are not frozen and immutable, right, which is an important point to make, right, so it's not a kind of uh, reverse Platonism. Uh, so if performativity creates being then, in some sense, it must metaphysically and explanatorily precede description or prescription. This, what I'm ca uh, calling existential contract, creates the sort of objects to which propositions might refer, and thus creates the current conditions for referential truth of either sort, either prescriptive reference or descriptive reference. The performative antecedes and conditions both the descriptive and the legal and carries normativity with it, a way that things ought to be. This does not amount to ethics as such, but because performativity entails boundaries and limits and limits imply constraint or restriction, all manner of organization have oughtness built in. An important consequence is that the boundary between the normative and the descriptive taken as gospel by many since Hume washes away on a Sarsian model of reality. Nevertheless, the specific contents of subsequent prescriptions may vary. 
The values of each cannot be inferred directly just from the existence of limits. So moral facts, properties, and so forth have not satisfactorily been explained yet, for the process of moral construction has yet to be detailed in full. And furthermore, I just ran out of time, so I'm happy to stop and uh, I will not bang on about this. And I'm happy, if I have some other thoughts I'd like to submit to question that can happen now or can happen after, so. Um, Please, please, to elaborate on where you ended up. Yep. Explain how the communication extends beyond conscious beings and language and things like that. Actually, you explain how uh, uh, that the we can identify something like moral facts in different situations which are not uh, fixed. Um, I guess one way of putting the question would be where does where do you what what allows you to use the moral there? Mm. Okay, one way of putting the question. Yeah. Right. Um to put it another way, uh you said just a little bit earlier on evaluation that occurs with organization. Yeah. Um uh, and I'm thinking, okay, well what would that evaluation what might that look like? Um it could look like yeah. interests. Could look like preferences. Um, is how far are we? Have, does that get us as far as talking about laws of evaluation and a, a moral language, or is this this a narrower account of interests? No, no. Thank you for that question because it opens up sort of into the the things that I wanted to discuss in subsequent slides. <laughs> so uh, let me take the first bit first. Uh, it doesn't get us to anything moral yet, right? But I do think that there are Sarazian constraints um, that sort of answer to the description that I put earlier about being both moral and non-moral simultaneously. And I don't think that we need to go as far as the language of interests to understand that there are constraints that govern various normative contexts, right? Including the very basis of organization themselves. So many of you have described uh, the movement from the local to the global, uh, which I've taken to calling the principle of loving synthesis, uh, taking that from the natural contract where Sarah talks about love being the first law, uh, and, and the idea that the movement from the local to the global can't be one that's dominating, and so you have to respect different the integrity of different localities, you might say. So it isn't that the locality itself has to express the interest, right? It's that we can make the move and simultaneously respect that it's there. Uh, without necessarily having to understand it, if, if that sort of makes sense. So uh, is maybe negotiation in the sense that one, uh, Vera brought up navigation, right? So we talk about negotiating terrain. So part of our contract might be the way that we move through things, right? So we respect this locality and find some way to include it or synthesize it in a larger picture without dominating it, exploiting it, and so on. Um, how does that become a kind of moral but non-moral at the same time principle or constraint? Well, it's precisely the same constraint we see in Sarah's epistemology, I'm sorry, nosiology, where we have, we don't have a reduction. There's no one sort of master discipline or subject area or, or ticket gate to understanding knowledge, right? Uh, and so knowledge is federative where we join together diverse elements without trying to privilege one over the other. Uh, I would say that that maps pretty neatly onto Sarah's discussion of perception, right? So this idea of integrating information through different sensory modalities. So it's both a metaphysical, epistemological, and ultimately sort of ethical principle. How do we treat different people? Where does it show up as an ethical principle? I think the discussion of distributive justice in the natural contract is fairly explicit in that way. And as you discussed the idea of uh, the sort of reciprocity in uh, that he draws out of the uh, principle of sufficient reason. As I read that, I say, well, there's Rawls difference principle, right? Which is, I mean, a very different sort of take on it, but it's effectively the mechanism that's there for Rawls as well. He just doesn't acknowledge it in the same sorts of terms, right? The idea that you could have uh, 
relationships between groups that are unequal, but nevertheless end up being moral, right? Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, I have a question of about what you understand by including the excluded third. Mm. Um, it was at the very beginning when you were talking about, um, um, I think it was in the context of like um, the boundary between moral and non-moral mm -hmm. influence. And it seemed to me, but like correct me if I'm wrong, that the excluded third um, is kind of a middle position. Yes. But do you think it's like a middle position as if like it would just um, bring these together or or is the 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 um the the whole point of um the excluded third that it's something different that mm. is excluded? That might be, yeah, I think it could I think it could be both, if that makes sense. I think in the context of of thinking about formal logic and the sort of his argument, I think um, it's certainly true that you could read the excluded middle as just being the third alternative that runs the horns. But I think it could be in the case of something like the natural contract where you're excluding a material thing, right? So I think that that could be translated a couple of different ways. If that's, that's I don't know if that's answering your in question. The, in, the, in the case of the natural contract, it's also that like um, these interests fighting against each other hmm. and the, the, the kind of middle ground of these interests would not be the, the excluded third. The excluded third is something radically different. It hmm. is yeah. So, because I think if we if we think the like the the third in this way, we actually don't get it. If it's a middle position, can you elaborate? I'm not sure I follow exactly. In in my argument, you mean, or yes, in okay. in in the way of thinking, the excluded third as a middle position between like um, mm. a duality. I think that okay. kind of then is at stake to miss the point. I see. So. Uh, yeah, I'd have to think about that a bit and see if I can, I don't have a ready answer. Uh, it's the same point yeah. as the steering a ship, a ship, huh? It's not about how do we do least harm to the ocean, how to be prevented from swallowing us. Mm -hmm. it's, the, it's not the middle position, yeah. it's, the, it's, the, it's, it's the, great, the great round. Okay. Is it necessarily not a middle position? So, and I, I asked it as a genuine question because it seems like you might have that, and that's why I sort of meant both. Because mm -hmm. uh, if 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 the excluded third can't be a middle position, then I understand your point. But if then that, that seems like a problem. But if it could be, it seems like there's ways to. What would be an example of a middle position and an exclusion? I mean, I'm open yeah. to that. I just wonder yeah. what that is. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna have to think about that more. Hmm. But there's an in service to see. There's an interesting, and I, I don't, I, I don't think I understand what it's about. But this argument with the sea, you know, where it says so long we have used the sea uh, for ship, as a, for for uh, for for making war on the continents of the terrans, and now it has inverted, and we need to defend the seas. I don't remember in which book whether it is in the global war or whether it is in one of the lectures he gave. But he he uh, he speaks about how this um, it has to do with the with the exhaustion of the of the oceans from its uh, from its life. No, so, so so that it has the, the argument as I made sense of it is that until now the, I mean the the, the 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 ground on which we can live is very small of the earth compared to the ground on which you cannot live. The oceans are much larger, and the argument is that um, that for a very long time. This much larger ter terrain of the oceans has allowed us to move with certain spaces of arbitration on the continent. And now this needs to be turned inside out. So we need to move on the continent such as to keep the, uh, 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 the oceans alive. And he made the argument with, uh, with being an, an, uh, um, when he was an, an, an officer, I think, no, in the military, on the, on the, uh, in the Navy. But I didn't quite get get um, the point. But that would be the next example. So if we kill, if we say, okay, the, the the excluded third, we treat it as a middle position, we need to kill it. So then it's no longer a threat. That would be one example, perhaps, mm. of this, because it's it's radically disproportionate. That's the thing with having a third, which is a middle term between between two, and having a third, which yeah. is 
great surroundings that uh, we are actually we need to surrender to to a certain extent. So if you try, it's like these uh, these projects now of of making um, you know the geoengineering projects of covering the, the the sphere around the Earth to protect the the global heating. So it's this it's this geoengineering that is a, a radical disproportion in in uh, in in in, in, in scales actually. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Um, I mean, the, the sense, there's a sense of uh, uh, excluded code that you can, I think you can cooperate with, but while perhaps it's not a middle position, it does at least ensure a uh, commitment uh, between internal cubes. So two sides of the triangle are in, in effect trying to uh, cooperate. So there's, there's a cooperative principle. I wish you could even bring Bryce in, in along here. Um, so maybe different avenues you could you could pursue. Um, uh, there is a cooperative principle, and but it's a cooperation against the potential dissolution of what you're trying to exclude, which is dissolution itself, mm -hmm. entropy and noise and um, and, and nonsense. Um, which is why uh, it's why the, you get these paradoxical statements that war is an agreement, right? Up to the last bit, which is the point where you fight each other, you're still utterly in agreement with this whole, you know, iceberg, the whole body of the iceberg underneath that is, 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 it shares the same code. But well, that code's under threat, and you, at least, at the very least, you need to do to be those two triangle, two points in the triangle, of which is excluded uh, the, the middle. The very least you need to do is to conjointedly resist that. Um, so, uh, that's a sketch of thank you, Bill. Yeah, respect that. Thank you, cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you.